Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Black Philanthropy, Black Philanthropy Month celebration. We are so excited to have you join us. I'm just going to go over a couple of ground rules to get us started today. We are in webinar format. All participants are muted. The closed captioning is on. If you want to turn it off, you can select the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Some people like closed captioning and some prefer not to have it on. So we are um, making both options available for you. If you're having difficulties, please reach out to us in the chat. You'll, you'll see um, the chat button at the bottom as well and we will see your message. Please submit any questions that you have for our awesome panelists using the Q&A feature at the bottom. So uh, I am Erica Bradley. I am the manager of community philanthropy at the Community Foundation for Greater New Haven. And it is my honor to welcome you today. I am here representing um, our partnership. The partners are the Fairfield County Community Foundation, the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving, the Prosperity Foundation, and the Community Foundation for Greater New Haven. So on behalf of all of us, we welcome you today. We wanted to have a collective celebration today, a statewide celebration. So let me just back up for a second and tell you exactly, for those who may not be aware, what Black Philanthropy Month is and why we're so proud to celebrate it. It was started in 2011 by Dr. Bouvier, Dr. Jacqueline Bouvier Copeland and the Pan-African Women's Philanthropy Network. It's an annual celebration, a global celebration. And again, we're proud to celebrate that here in Connecticut. I'd like to also just um, share with you who leads our charge in each of the foundations. So you have Will Ginsburg, who's the president and CEO of the Community Foundation for Greater New Haven. Jay Williams, who is the president and CEO of the Harvard Foundation for Public Giving, or Sella Hughes, who is the executive director of the Prosperity Foundation, and Mendy Blue Paca, who is the president and CEO of the Fairfield, Fairfield County Community Foundation. So again, we welcome you. I, it gives me such joy and such honor to welcome our moderator for today, Dr. Leon Bailey Jr. He is the Senior Vice President of Human Resources and Organizational Culture at the Community Foundation for Greater New Haven. So without further ado, I turn this wonderful program over to Dr. Bailey. Erica, Erica, thank you so much. This is an exciting event. I am so proud to be a part of this collective effort that um, is bringing four very important organizations together to present an important topic, Black Philanthropy, honoring Black Philanthropy Month. And you need not know about me because the real stars of the show I'm about to uh, present to you. Um, but I have to say this at the onset, we're gonna run out of time. We will not be able to adequately cover the topic, but we will do our best with the expertise of this panel to get as far as we can in this conversation around Black philanthropy. And so let me just introduce the panelists one at a time. And um, Andrea Hawkins, would you please come on, introduce yourself and the organization that you represent. For sure, for sure. Good good morning. Yes. No, nope, actually it's 1204. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Andrea Hawkins. I am the CEO and founding partner of a few businesses. Um, so the one where I spend the majority of my time is called Leading Culture Solutions. Um, and it's a boutique business advisory firm that helps organizations with culture transformation, strategic planning, and leadership development with a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens. Uh, I also co-own three cafes with my dear husband, Doug. We own Birkin's Blend Cafe, Birkin's on Oak, and Birkin's on Main. Um, and uh, we also have, uh, we have started a, a donor-advised fund. Uh, so I'm pretty proud about that. And I guess that is sort of a business. Um, it does take time for us to manage it uh, overall. But I am so delighted to be here. Andre, thank you so much. Next, I'd like to bring up Ashley Hampton. Ashley, please. 
Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Ashley Hampton. In my full-time employment, I am a clinical director at Domus Kids Inc. in Stanford. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by trade. I also have my own consulting business where I work with local not-for-profit agencies and some school systems and police departments to be able to provide training on trauma, on the impacts of trauma specifically in the black and brown communities. And I'm also a proud member and scholarship chair of Laytrez Inc. I'm so grateful to be here. Thank you for having me. Ashley, thank you. I'm glad you're here as well. Next is my pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Shaka Felder McIntyre. Please. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, such an honor and a pleasure to be here with you all. I hope this day has been well for you. Um, I am here today in the role as the founder of Higher Heights Youth Empowerment Programs. Higher Heights is a 20-year-old um, state college access organization here in the state of Connecticut that I founded 20 years ago um, to support and really expose all of our students to post-secondary success. Um, in uh, the organization itself, it has supported over 10,000 students um, throughout its years in the state of Connecticut, um, and it is now supporting schools outside of Connecticut as well. We have a very streamlined focus, um, which is to open doors for students and for families. Um, that is at the core of what the organization does. I also have my own consulting uh, company as well um, that focuses on DEI and also on wellness. I'm also a certified life coach and a certified personal trainer. And again, I welcome you all and excited to have this conversation today. Dr. Shaka, thank you. Thank you for that. And last but not least, it's my honor to present to you um, Eric Clements. Eric, would you please? Yes, good afternoon. And, and thank you, Leon and, and Erica and, and others for allowing me to give voice to this very important topic. My name is Eric Clemens, founding CEO of CONCAT and founding CEO of CONCORP. Um, CONCAT is a workforce development arts after school and summer training program, uh, arts after school and, and summer program um, where we really train adults for um, market relevant jobs in New Haven. ConCorp, which I also run and, and I'm co-founder, is our economic development, economic justice organization, where in all five verticals of our work, we aggressively address poverty. Um, love both organizations and, but what gives me joy is um, the fact that my myself and my four daughters started the Butterflies Fund, which I hope I'm able to give voice to today in some capacity. And the Butterfly Fund is um, really named after my late wife, Sharon Clemens, um, where we are giving scholarships to young Black girls going to Smith College, Tuskegee University, Hampton University, and Spelman College, the four colleges that my daughters attended and graduated from. Happy to be here. Thank you, Eric. So if all the panelists could come on camera and let us get ready to engage in this powerful conversation, I am, I have chills just thinking about the theme that was presented around Black Philanthropy Month, Black Love in Action. Um, and I'm also in awe of the panel because three out of four of the panelists are founders. You all have been starting some stuff and so proud of that. And Ashley, we know you're about to found something. So, you know, we'll, we'll give you time. Unfortunately, I wasn't around in 1947 when Lacey started. So uh, that, <laughs> I'm okay with that. It, it, it's okay. I'm glad you're okay with that. So let's just kick it off. What does Black Love in Action look like from your perspective, from what it is you have a hand in that actually touches the philanthropy field? Um, let me kick it off with Ashley, since you're the... Uh, Anyway, I'm not going to call you the baby of the group, but let's kick it off with you. What is Black Love in Action? Well, I think, you know, to me, Black love looks like community. Um, I think that love takes on lots of different forms. We, you know, I think in conversation, we think about it in terms of relationships, but love also means what you, what you put into and um, what you invest in your community. I think being connected to people around you, having a sense of obligation, to be tied to people who have invested in your community. Um, you know, when we look at Black love, we look at that there's such a rich, rich history 
because we were not afforded the same opportunities that our counterparts were, right? And so we had to create opportunities for ourselves. And so being able to honor those traditions and being able to engage in ways to be able to keep people together and to keep traditions going, to continue to pour money and resources and business. I love hearing um, how many people of color own businesses in this area, looking to serve people in this area and then uplifting our youth, right? Like making sure that our youth and our young people are aware of those traditions and importance of ownership. So love to me looks like community coming together and making sure that we are supporting one another. Ashley, I love that. I mean, just hitting the nail right on the head, the expressions that reflect on our community. It's perfect. Andrea, I'm going to uh, call you next and Dr. Shaka, get ready. You're after Andrea. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, and building on what Ashley just said. Um, so I grew up in the projects in Hartford, right? So I meet people now and they say, where are you from? I'm like from right here, I'm from right here, right? Um, I, I went the non-traditional route to college. Um, I did my schooling starting in community college, going through my master's degree, 25 years part-time at night not an optimal path. So I always find young people and say, don't do it that way too hard. Um, so I, but I had a chance to have some jobs in the bigs, right? So worked at Aetna, Cigna, Mass Mutual, the Hartford, United Adopter, Prudential, and TIA Craft, right? Before I embarked on my own journey, having my own business. So I had a chance to see life from very many points of view, right? Growing up, with very little, I didn't know I was poor because I had everything I needed. I was never hungry. I was never without shoes and clothes. You know, I went to private school for a portion of my education. I did not know that I was poor <laughs> until I joined the workforce hmm. and realized, you know, that I did not have the same access. I did not have the same resources. I did not have the same supports. And so that really helped me um, think about what would I do differently if I had it to do all over again? You know, what have I done with my daughter? And I now have three daughters. What, have, what are we doing? How are we pouring into those children so that they have the best opportunity to be their absolute best self? Uh, I'm pretty proud of who I am and, you know, what I've accomplished over my life and my career. I always say to my family, I could die tomorrow and be completely happy and satisfied with what my life has been. But I often think about what might my life have been if someone poured into me younger. And, and I had the things, the basics that I needed, but imagine what my life would have been if I had more opportunities and more access. And so that has always been important to me as an adult, as I realized not everybody starts at the same place and not everybody gets the same access to opportunity. And so in everything that we do, that is how we think about it. How do we lift people up? How do we show them a path? How do we help them on that path so that they can be the absolute best that they can be and what they want to be? So that's, that's what philanthropy and love looks like to me, is pouring into the community that poured into you um, over your lifetime. I, I thank you, Andrea. I like that reference of pouring into another. I mean, that's an expression of love that can't be matched or be. That's that's what it looks like. Dr. Shaka, please, and then Eric. I think um, black love for me, um, what it looks and feels like is is unity. Um, I love when I see black love in unity. Um, I love when I see Black love in um, like a collective work, a collaboration. Um, um, I love when I see Black love um, on purpose. So when people are actually going in their purpose, um, which for me, if you, if you know me, um, Black love to me is also faith. Um, is connected to that. So I love when I see all those things connected and then the creativity that comes amongst that, even if it's just two people having a conversation or a vibe, um, or if it's more than two people and it's a collective unit and it's a community. 
Um, but I love when I see Black love on purpose and unity um, and then walking um, in, in that faith, in that faithful space. Um, to me, that's what, that's what Black love is. And, I, and for myself, that's what I've tried to do throughout my work, um, professionally, personally. I've always tried to keep those pillars um, at the core of, of everything that I do and how I like to exude love um, in everything that's that's around me um, and, and the circles that I like to keep. That's Black love for me. Shaka, exuding love everywhere you are. I like that. I like that. Thank you for that. Eric, how does that occur for you, Black love? Yeah, I've been thinking about this question since you presented it a couple of weeks ago. And before talking about Black love, I think it's more important to me to really define love um, in a way where you look at the emergence of love in conditions for Black people that's not conducive to love. Right? We think about the systems of race, the systems of class, the systems that have been created for the express purpose of one holding an entire race down, yet still love emerged from Black people and not only activated, but has been demonstrated. And so for me, I have to really think about, you know, love as I see it now and love as, I, as, as it was when we were enslaved, right? And folks still mustered up a love for people, whether through God and faith or through the fact that they had to get through this in order for me to live. And so that's where my mind is. And I think the essential question, given your question is, you know, what is the price of the ticket for black people to activate and demonstrate love in this society now. And so I think philanthropy is one of those, you know, one of those things where we demonstrate and express love. Um, but it takes a certain level of courage, Leon, for us to continue to demonstrate and express love in a society where love is not, that, that society is not conducive to expression and demonstration of black love. Anything said black now becomes a problem. So I'm still working through that, quite frankly. But I, I think, you know, the fact that you and, and Erica and the Community Foundation and other foundations that have been named here are having this conversation tells me that you all are courageous as well. Thank you for that, Re Reverend Clements. Thank you for that. <laughs> and, and you, but you bring up an important point. Let me just reflect on it for a moment. Black love, and I'm, I'm just paraphrasing what I heard you say, Black love is actually making strides, taking strides in the face of no agreement. It beyond that which is oppositional and still having an impact. And to that point, the work that is reflected by the panel is actually a powerful expression of what you're talking about because it takes more than just dollars there has to be a spiritual and a psychic investment in the face of no agreement to be a founder to be a fund leader to be a program leader to be an entrepreneur absolutely hit the nail on the head and to your other point eric about how we live in this racialized society, the stereotypical image of folks of color does not apply here to this group. It's amazing. And it's an illustration of accomplishment in the face of no agreement. Eric, you came off mute. Go ahead. Yeah, I, thank you, it, because you're inspiring me as everyone else has. Um, so far. What's really important to note for me is that there is no love without hope, right? Hope, in my opinion, is the seed of love. And so the fact that we are all here today being able to do what we 
been able to do thus far in our life, as, as Andrea was, was talking about that, there's a deep sense of hope that we work from. And I'll say myself, I work from every single day. If, the, if, if I had no hope, then I have absolutely nothing. And that hope moves me to love. I love it. I love it. Andrea, go ahead. You came yeah. off mic. Yeah, I, I would love to build on Eric's sentiments, right? So it's hope. And, and I would say for myself, it's a belief in our innate ability to do more and be better than our ancestors even ever imagined, right? So the hope is yes, but for me, I, I wake up every morning believing with God in my spirit, with God in everything that I do, but believing that I can do and be the things that I want to do and be. Now, I'm not naive to believe that I can do and be those things without help and support. So it's why relationship is important. And if we don't see ourselves as responsible for and connected to every single other human being, we will not achieve what we are trying to achieve. So in my spirit, every single day, I feel responsible for every human that I encounter, for their success, you know, for their joy, for the, and look, I can do what I can do. I can only change me, but I can change me in a way that I'm hoping inspires that next person to also believe. Andrea, thank you for that. So I can easily say and, and extrapolate from what you presented is wherever you are, there is the presence of hope and the experience of community. It's not just words. It's not just words. Dr. Shaka, don't shake your head and think I'm not going to call on you. I need you. We're, way in here. I think it is how we show up. Um, and it is, it is, it is how we show up and it is our mindset. We can either be contributors, we can either be destroyers. Um, we, we have the power to choose. And I think collectively, what I know for black people is that our power, um, even as individuals, but also as collectively, is just amazing. And I think that's what makes people scared. So we know our power. I say that like, so like you scared. All right, fine. But, you know, um, but our, our power is there. I want us to get to a place of understanding that power. I want us to get to a space where we understand that power collectively in a space of expansion and growth, not in a, a, a space of destruction. Um, and that that resonates with me. I know Eric and I have had these conversations many of thousands of times, um, but our collective unit is powerful and we need to understand that more. That's where love sits in a collective unit, right? Um, but it's also about how you show up individually. You need to decide on where you want to be in this space. Do you want to be powerful and collective and part of the expansion or are you gonna be a destroyer? Um, and so that's, that's what resonates with me, Leon. Shaka, thank you for that. I, 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 you caused me pause when you talk about the collective nature of what that could look like, or what's possible of how one shows up can actually make all the difference in the world. And I think coming into that awareness of what you're pointing to in terms of that presence, it does frighten many folks. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it creates a challenge to what has actually built this country, uh, the challenge of assimilation, you know, and so assimilation is very different than belonging. Assimilation is very different than maintaining and keeping our voice. And I think going back to the original point that you were making, Eric, about how we have made it because of hope, because of love, that element has not gone away in the face of assimilation. That element has provided a experience of community that has us be 
fearful to some folks. <laughs> and to your point, Dr. Shaka, that's where our secret sauce is. That's our, well, don't let it get out. Just love everybody because that's what we do. I'm sorry, I'm talking too much. I need to be interrupted with some new fresh thinking. And, oh, Ashley, can you help me with that? Sure, I'll do my best. So talk, talk to us, what's on your mind? What's coming up for you? And if you need a question to answer, it's like, and how does black love show up in what it is you do and where it shows up? Yeah, I'm, th I'm thinking about this in terms of how late tries the, the organization on which I sit came about, right? So um, I'm so grateful to be a part of late tries. We, we have our meetings every month um, and there's approximately 20, 25 ladies who, who sit on late tries. And I'll talk a little bit about how it came to be, because for me, it is the definition of Black love and community. Um, and, and so every month when I attend, it's it's just this beautiful, it's this beautiful gathering of women who have dedicated decades, decades of their life to making sure that we are progressing the next generation, to making sure that we are part of contributing to their success and their ability to attend college. Um, so, just to give a little bit of history about Leitrez, it started in 1947. This was during the 40s when African Americans were coming uh, very progressively over to the Bridgeport area to be able to work in industry, right? And so during that time, um, there were some college graduates and black college graduates that lived in the area who felt like, how can I give back to my community? How can I make sure that we are uplifting this next generation? And so there were 13 founding women, 13 professional educated women, many of them were teachers and educators themselves, one being Geraldine Johnson, I'm, I'm, she's our local hero and, and legacy maker. Um, she was a founding member also, and they felt like it was very important to be able to give money to to young people, to be to African American, at the time, not just African American boys to be able to attend college, right? And so our first donation, which they were very proud of, it was at a garden party and it was for $100. And the way they raised money was through uh, dinners, selling dinners, selling pies. And over a period of time, it, it gained traction. They started having celebrations. And in the 1980s, we had a member, I believe her name was Ruth Corum, who had left her house to Leitrez. And so Carolyn Rogers, who was our president at the time, work to be able to invest that money, which actually went in turn to the Bridgeport Area Foundation, um, which, later be, which later was absorbed by Fairfield County Community Foundation. And so over time, we have become, which I just learned from Ryan, one of the largest scholarship endowments that Fairfield, Community, uh, Fairfield County Community Foundation has. And so every year we come together and um, we meet the, the next graduating class, we interview them. And it's such a beautiful thing. I, I mean, I, having worked with kids most of my career, being able to sit with them and, and interview them, it's more so a formality and to make them realize like this is a big deal, right? Um, you know, asking them what their plans are, what they want to do with, with their lives, how they see themselves coming back and contributing to the community. So for me, this is a big part of, of Black love in my community is being able to participate with these wonderful women over the, the, over the last few years. I've just joined in 2017, so I'm new, uh, but our oldest, our longest standing member has been with Leitrez for 65 years. Another member has been for, with Leitrez for 50 years. Uh, many of our members have been there for 40, 30 years. So I, I, uh, I'm, I'm one of the latecomers, but I'm, I'm so grateful and blessed to be able to sit here and talk to the importance of this organization today. That was wow. a lot of words, no, <laughs> but no, I'm no, passionate no. about it. <laughs> no, and, and, yeah. and Ashley, to that point, your passion comes through, but what also comes through is the commitment of the folks who started it, the mm -hmm. sustainability of folks who have been involved for 50, 60 years, that's, right. That's a powerful statement, not to be taken lightly. And you, as part of that fabric, being a part of this discussion just enhances the entirety of what this webinar is about. You know, it's one thing, and we'll get into donations and how much and the fund value and all that. that that's nice and good. It's really, in my opinion, vitally important that we keep an awareness of what the 
founding elements were. What was the passion? What was the motivation? Why do we do this? What is the engine behind it all? So that it doesn't become a rote thing where we check a box. It doesn't become, here's my little $20, leave me alone. That's it right. becomes the aspect of who we are that's inescapable. It becomes yeah. an expression that actually gives rise to where we are going. And to, 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 to your point, Ashley, a future that we will probably not see, but we know that we have planted the seeds for that to be. Yes, that's right. Yeah, and the tradition in history to me is so rich. And so so the idea of, of black love and philanthropy it really does live in organizations like this, it really does. I love it. Thank you for that, Ashley. So talk to me about Andrea, talk to me about the Birkins Family Fund, if you would. Sure, absolutely. So um, it is kind of a, an interesting story um, for Christmas. So I started leading Culture Solutions. And right when I started it, I started in August and March, COVID hit. So here I was starting up this business <laughs> and people were going into their caves, trying to everybody trying to stay alive, especially in the black and brown communities. Um, and so kind of got it started, but lost every one of my clients by March of 2020. So I had to kind of start building back up again. And, and sadly, George Floyd was murdered. And that was sort of the catalyst for my business um, because people were really starting to understand that, you know, every, everything is not just and, and we need to do better. As organization. So started getting a number of phone calls, had a fantastic, you know, three years, right? Um, the business has been thriving. We've been doing tons of work. And this Christmas of 2021, uh, you know, along with our other businesses, we had some pretty decent years. So my husband decided he was going to buy me a beautiful ring. I mean, this thing was gorgeous, like five carats of all types of diamonds. And it was gorgeous. And Christmas day, I opened up this ring at the box and, you know, blown away. And as I, I couldn't even put it on, honestly, I, in my mind, I just kept thinking, what, what, where am I going to wear this thing to? Where am I going? Like, you know, like this is not a every day and I'm not that person that's like out in the streets like that. So in the more I thought about it, I felt like I should not, not that I don't deserve it. It's not even about that, but more like I would rather have an experience with my family. If we're going to spend that kind of money and we, cause right. What's his is mine. And what's mine is his. <laughs> if we're going to spend that kind of money, I really would love to do something that was going to have a more lasting memory or impact or something. And so we talked about it. He was not real happy when I took the ring back to the store and asked for the money. Um, but I took that money and I started the Birkins family. We started, we, we talked a lot about it. It was a lot of back and forth <laughs> and a lot of, you are not a grateful person kind of conversation <laughs> that was held. Um, but my husband knows me and in, you know, he has been along for the ride um, and it's like, whatever will make you happy will make me happy. And so we agreed that we would start the Birkins Family Fund. And we were able to fund that account with $50,000 to begin with by returning that ring. Mm -hmm. um, and I think about the lasting impact that will happen over time. Uh, in the next year for Juneteenth, um, we did a, a fundraiser and we're able to raise 25,000 more. So in the last couple of years, we've raised $75,000. It's not a lot of money, but you know what? It's a start. We've been, you know, two years in terms of us growing the fund. Um, I got big plans for other fundraising and some things that I'd like to do to bring our community together and fundraise for it. Um, I just don't have time. <laughs> if I, I did, I would be doing more faster to, to raise money. Uh, in addition, because, you know, um, our businesses are doing well, we 
outside of the fund are giving back to our community and have contributed over $25,000 from through our uh, revenue that we get from our businesses. So for us, it's not just about it's the fund. We haven't given any money out of the fund yet because I, I really have an idea in my mind that I'd like to get that fund at least to $100,000 before we start giving out of it. And what we want to do is give micro grants to folks that are starting up businesses. So I was 48. My husband was 50 when we opened our first business. That's kind of late in life to be going out on a limb, right? <laughs> And doing that. But what we found was that people don't give you money when you're starting up businesses. They're like, prove you are going to survive. Well, how are you going to survive if you don't get money and help to keep it going? So that's what we endeavor to do with this fund is to help folks who are starting up businesses and give them micro grants. Because, you know, a lot of people offered us loans. I don't know. I, we didn't want to take the risk of starting up a business and also having a loan worried that we would not be able to pay it back. So I really, you know, I hope this encourages other foundations and other organizations to give to people who are starting. Yes, they're not all going to succeed, but some of them will, right? And some of them will do big things. And, and I just feel very passionate about doing whatever we can do to help these fledgling businesses get themselves up and moving forward. So that's a little bit about um, the fund and, you know, where we give and we, we give primarily to this to this community. We are also members of the um, Black Giving Circle that's administered through the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving because we do feel like it matters um, where and how we give in our community. So. Well, Andrea, first of all, thank you for sharing a wonderful story. And I am just so impressed by, um, I'll start this way and get my little material self out of the way. Um, the sacrifice of taking the ring back. Oh my goodness. So once I get over that, <laughs> the- you know, I'm the, sure you can have a long conversation with my husband who still says, you return everything I buy for you, which is absolutely not true, but that just <laughs> further- well, Fostered as, an as, argument. No, exactly. As a placeholder, I could see how that would remain in place. I mean, <laughs> it would be hard to. Well, anyway, let me not get, go down that tone. And more, more, more to the other points that you brought up in terms of the commitment, the emotional obligation to community, the vision for the future. That other word that uh, Eric brought into the discussion about hope and how to build on that hope such that, again, even those things which we may not see in the future will be fueled. And that's what it's about because I'm not sure how many different ways or if there is a limit to the different ways that black love can be expressed. I don't think there's a limit to that. And so every expression is a good one. And thank you for your entrepreneurship, which actually is an illustration to others as well of what hope looks like, of what it could be. Great, I appreciate that. I, I want to just add one small thing too, right? Of course, so of course. Um, there, there was a question here about, you know, how we have three daughters, 31, 25, and 23. And we've really made it a point of telling them that we were doing this right? They saw us Christmas day, they saw the ring, right? <laughs> and they saw all of it. And then there was a conversation about returning the ring and why we were doing that and how they're going to probably outlive us. You know, it started the conversation about their responsibility in giving, right? Their responsibility in keeping this going and helping us um, and helping our community continue to thrive, right? And so that helped us start to have conversations about philanthropy and the things that they were doing in their own communities, because of course they've left Connecticut, right? And one's in Brooklyn and one's in Montreal and one is in uh, Alexandria, Virginia. Um, and it doesn't matter where they are. I want them to feel a sense of responsibility 
in their communities. Um, so they do what they can. Right now, all they have is time and talent. There's not a lot of treasure when you're under <laughs> when you're under 40, uh, but that's what they do, right? And they find ways to give back in their own community. The oldest one sits on a board for a nonprofit and provides a lot of time and support to them. And the younger two, um, they work with animals. They love animals. So they do a lot of volunteerism, um, helping out shelters and, and boarding dogs that have don't have homes and so forth. So um, just do what you can, right? If you can only give $5, give $5. If you can give a dollar, give a dollar. If you can give time, give time, right? If you can give some talent that you have, give that talent, find out who needs it and give it away, right? Give it away. So we just want to be an example for them of the importance of being responsible for their communities. Andrea, thank you for that. And, and just to touch on that follow-up point you presented, you have absolutely infused family values in them that actually honor being in service and honor hope. That's a takeaway. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I'm, I'm sure where they serve is appreciated. Dr. Shaka, you've been quiet too long. Get ready, Eric. Yes, Dr. Shaka. Um, uh, what would you like for me to explain or expand upon a little bit more? So, well, there are a couple of things. Because the work that you do, mm -hmm. the support that you provide, yeah. the involvement in the community, the lives that you touch, um, I'd rather have you tell those stories that come back to philanthropy that are related to and is your, you know, um, your life expression. Sure. So for me, um, and some people know my story and some people don't, um, I was born and raised in Harlem, New York. Um, I came to Connecticut in 2002 um, in, in, as a school counselor. And um, immediately in that role, saw the need to support students around post-secondary success. However, years before that, um, I was in my apartment in Buffalo, New York. I'm a graduate of Buffalo State College, proud graduate of Buffalo State College. And um, I was in my apartment and I got a vision from God um, and wrote down everything that I was being told on uh, an eight and a half by 11 note notepad. And what I was being told was the, the vision for what now is Higher Heights. And I literally wrote out all that Higher Heights is. Um, I didn't have a name for the organization. I just knew that I was being told to write out all of the, the programs, the services, the people, the connections, the work, um, the entire vision. I don't know where it came from. I just, it just was what it was. Um, then I moved to Connecticut, um, became a school counselor, um, was again connected back to that vision, started Higher Heights as a after-school program on Saturdays with 25 students the first year. The second year, it grew to 50 students. The third year, it grew to 100 students. We are now sitting at 10,000 students. And, I, and when I spoke about earlier about Black love and what it means to me around purpose and around faith, that's exactly like who I am. I don't move without faith and without purpose in any of those spaces. And the work that Higher Heights does is grounded in that. Um, and, and to know that we have impacted 10,000 students, 100% of our students have graduated from high school, 80% of our kids um, go on to post-secondary success. We've helped um, students secure over close now to $800 million and scholarships and grants, like to me, it's not about, it's, it's passion, it's um, purpose, it's the gift that I was given. And, and I am like a hundred thousand percent um, committed to walking in that purpose. And, and, and I, 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 I want everyone else to find what your purpose is. It might be entrepreneurship. Um, because most people don't think that nonprofit work is entrepreneurship, but it is entrepreneurship. <laughs> um, and it, but it, you might, you're an engineer, you might be a teacher, you might be an Uber driver, like find your, your gift and your purpose because your gift and your purpose opens up doors for everything else. 
Will, will the work be hard? Yes. I'm extremely excited that Higher Heights has turned 20 years old. Um, when I started the organization, it was hard. I'm not going to lie. Like, but the, the traction has gained enough space where now we're in spaces where we have always dreamed that we were to be. And now even more doors are opening up. Doors I've never even envisioned, Leon, are starting to open up. But it's all for the benefit of kids. And for me, that's all I care about is to create opportunities for students to be exposed to anything post-secondary that they want to go into. And um, now the work is now even getting harder with this new round of SCOTUS decisions and things like that that are happening. Um, but that just refocuses us, right? So we are um, a, a people of self-determination. Uh, we will find a way to get through this um, because we've been highlighting our Blackness. The beauty of our Blackness is why they are doing the things that they're doing, but we will get through this. Um, and I know that um, Higher Heights is going to stay at the forefront of that work um, because that's what we do. And, and God gave me that vision to do that. And so when I go into spaces of like philanthropic conversations, I talk about like, what are your gifts? What do you want to give to? What do you want to stay connected to? What is your mission alignment? Um, when Higher Heights was founded, we were one of few minority organizations with the Community Foundation to start an endowment, the communities of color. We were one of the first nonprofit organizations, minority female-based organizations to open up an endowment. Super duper excited about that. The endowment still exists to this day. Um, but now it's, it's about keeping this movement of getting our kids exposed to opportunities and like expanding it and knocking it out the box. Because one thing I'm not gonna do is allow people to keep our kids in boxes. Um, the opportunities are endless and it, it's okay. If you wanna go into trade, you wanna go into employment, you wanna go into military, there's nothing wrong with that. But one, one thing I say, my kids hear me say this all the time. One thing I won't have you do is go to the University of Whaley Avenue. You will not be <laughs> at the University of Whaley Avenue. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. you will be <laughs> mm -hmm. in a space for for success, whatever that space is going to be. So um, for me, that's 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 what it is. That's who I'm about. Um, and I welcome anyone who wants to stay connected to be in that space, in that alignment. Um, so we can just just knock it out the box. That's it. Dr. Shaka, Dr. Shaka, uh, what do you want me to say, Leon? Mm, I'm so. <laughs> First of all. I am so moved by your story, and I know that's just a short version because the depth and the numbers that you have touched to make a difference is huge. And it had to be you, to your point. It had to come from you. And thank goodness for folks who are believers, this is for you. For folks who are non believers, deal with it. For you to be obedient to that which was placed in your heart is a powerful statement to embrace your gifts and giving it back in that way inside of the context of helping the community, young folks, it's huge. Thank you for being obedient. Thank you. And I'm afraid of what the evolution is gonna look like. It's gonna be so big, afraid in a good way. Yeah, just, just be obedient though. <laughs> I wanted to touch on something you said, um, doctor. Uh, I, I worked at a school in New Haven for for quite a while, and unfortunately, over the period over a period of the seven years, there's a lot of the young people that we worked with that ended up incarcerated. Um, and so, when I went back to graduate school, I did my internship on Whaley Avenue. I actually ended up working um, in the men's in the men's facility, the correctional facility. By that time, the juvenile facility had already closed down. And, and while I was there, there was so many young, young Black men that I wonder if they had been given a different chance, if they had been given a different opportunity, if somebody had said, I love you, like, let me show you what love looks like. I know that our families have had this trauma or our families have been through these things, but we can, we can figure this out. I, I thought all the time, if somebody had intervened, like you were speaking of doctor, that things would have been different for them. And so that's why I felt so compelled to work there with that population during that period of time. 
because I would sit there and I would I would talk with these with these grown men in their 40s and 50s who had been incarcerated in and out of in and out for probably 20, 15, 10, 30 years sometimes. And, and so when I'd ask them, did your father ever hit you? Or were you ever abandoned? Were you ever hungry? These grown men that had been incarcerated for so long were brought to tears because they'd said, nobody ever asked me that. Nobody ever asked me if somebody hurt me or if I was in pain. And so I see in the chat that there's a lot of agencies here that are working with people with legal histories and substance use. And I commend you for that because that's so important because these people are part of our community. And, and somewhere along the way, people have failed them. Um, and, and many of them have made mistakes on their own, you know, definitely acknowledge that. But I, I, I do commend the people on this call that I've just seen in the chat that work that you're doing, because that's so important to lift up every member of our community, because they are a part of our community. Thank you for that acknowledgement for uh, Dr. Shaka. Eric, what do you have going on? Because you always, your, your, your mental wheels are always turning. Yeah, thank you. How much time do we have, Leon? Is it, we're, we're done at one? We're, we're going we're gonna to give, <laughs> go ahead. Don't worry about it, Eric. We've right. run over. <laughs> no, we're um, in good shape. We have about 10 more minutes. We're in good right, shape. Perfect. Um, I, I won't be long. Uh, again, you know, one, I, I want to talk about the Butterflies Fund and, and, and the origin of that and, you know, uh, tragic origin, quite frankly, that my, my wife passed to COVID in 2020. And, you know, it was a, a moment in time uh, where sitting in, in the house, watching people at the, actually at the, the repast at our house, but there were at least 200 people at the house. And I was looking at my daughters being very polite to people who were coming to greet them and give condolences. And I said to myself, there has to be a different story here that my daughters can tell. And so I gathered them, quite frankly, in that moment, we huddled in the living room because I had an idea. I said, you know what? I want to start a fund in mommy's name. We'll call it the Butterflies Fund because my wife loved butterflies. Uh, she loved the idea of rebirth. And, and so we started this fund. And I, you know, I, I called the Community Foundation, Dottie, um, Dottie Weston Murphy and Erica Bradley. And we put the call out maybe a week after my wife's funeral. And we were able to re, we were, we were able to raise one point, about $1.7 million in about a month. And since then, we have given away $150,000 in scholarships the past three years to young black girls who were, who, who go to the schools that my daughter's attended and graduated from Smith College, Tuskegee University, Hampton University, and Spelman College. One, right, that's a salient example. The, the, the money that was given to the fund was a salient example of love. Sec that's first. Secondly, I've come to realize that being able to give funds to these young ladies and to some other organizations in New Haven, um, who I won't name, has um, really allowed me to confirm my humanity. Mm. It really allowed me to look at the type of human being I am and the type of human being I ultimately want to be. And so there was, there's this tension between self-preservation and self-discovery that I'm always wrestling with. And to Shaka's point, what is the self-discovery, right? What, who is it that I want to be? And I've been able to confirm that by giving to people, really important. Um, secondly, as it relates to the work that I do, as I mentioned, I, I run two organizations, Concat Concord. Um, really quickly, what, what, I, what I realized is as I do this work and do it successfully and execute at a level um, that I think is a good level, I've come to realize one, that you know you accumulate power and influence due to the work that you do on behalf of the people who need you to do that work. There comes a responsibility to, with that as well. Secondly, I, I, I come to realize now, given who I am, who I'm trying to be, the work that I do um, in community, building community, Black communities, aggressively addressing poverty, 
um, and building places in Black communities such that there's economic infrastructure and capital formation in those buildings and there's hope and love that whiteness can no longer define Blackness, my Blackness. And I think coming out of this conversation, I think it's great to talk about what we do, our funds and all that, but we need to better understand and discuss the conditions by which we do this work. Mm -hmm. The conditions that were created for that, that, uh, that has not allowed for other folk who look like us to work or live in their calling. And we know you're living in a calling when it chooses you, right? So when I hear Andrea and Ashley and Chaka talk about what they do, they, they didn't set out doing what they do, it called them and they heeded the call. But again, I, I think Leon and, and Erica, I think it's really important that we continue to discuss and discover the conditions that have been created for black people for the most part that is not conducive to success, let alone conducive to love. And the fact that folks have made it tells me love is real. And so I think that's important that again, and I can't say this enough, and this is not pejorative to any other race, but for far too long, whiteness has defined and interpreted blackness. And the work that these folks on this call is doing, and hopefully the, the folks who are in the chat, who are listening, that their work and their lives will not allow for whiteness and whatever that is, systematically especially, to define or interpret their blackness. Eric, 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 thank you. Thank you, because it's about, as I was saying earlier, accomplishment in the face of no agreement. Accomplishment despite the strong social pressure for assimilation. Accomplishment in the face of all of that, as you put it, Reverend Eric, you don't mind if I call you Reverend. <laughs> Accomplishment comes out of our collective love and hope for and with each other. Yes. And, Want and, to be talking, go, go, go ahead, please. And, and I think it's important also to note that there are white brothers and sisters who are allies, who are with us, right? As it relates, especially to philanthropy, but also to the hopes and dreams of a people that in fact, their dreams and hopes are facilitated by helping ours to be facilitated. That we are so interconnected, and I heard somebody say that earlier, that we are so interconnected that if in fact Black people don't make it, then the world won't. That is the truth. And so I'm, I'm finished there. Okay, Eric, thank you. And, and I'm just gonna ask Carmen, who is our backstage manager for this process, I'm going to declare that we're going to go over time and I'm requesting the panelists to uh, give us uh, 15 minutes more if that works and the folks on chat visiting stay if you can if you need to check out it's understood and I see Andrea you have come off of mute please. Uh, I, I think the thing that Eric is is bringing up for me just in, in this conversation is um, I, I want to go back and just say for, for each one of us to do what we can, right? Sometimes we get the call and the call is terrifying. Just ask my husband who has been along the ride with me, uh, wanting to open businesses, wanting to start a fund. He's like, what about our retirement? Like, I get that. I get that. We are not millionaires. So just be clear. <laughs> we are not millionaires. So we're not giving this money because there's, you know, $5 million in the bank and this is just excess, right? We have made a decision to do that. And so when I hear Eric talk and the other, you know, our other panelists here offering, it just, it's bringing up for me just this thought that everyone can do something. 
everyone can contribute in the way that feels comfortable for them and um, to take the step. Don't let the fear of what it might be. And I love what Dr. Shaka said, right? It's scary, but that does not mean you will fail, right? So be scared and go anywhere and go anyway. Step forward anyway, do what you can. Um, the one thing that I worry about sometimes is some, some of our young folks and some of our old folks, it's, I see it at every age and every level, people are so concerned about the me. They're so concerned about the me that they're, they're not even considering what might I do for someone else? What if I, right? And, and what would our world be like if, if we all got up every day and thought about what can I do for somebody else, not just how can the world serve me? What, what am I going to get out of it? What's in it for me? Because I will contend none of us got to where we got to without somebody else pouring into us. We didn't get to where we are without somebody else doing for us selfish, selflessly, right? Without asking for something back. And so what if we all took that attitude and, and really thought about how we could serve others? Can I add to that? <laughs> Absolutely, Dr. Without Dr. you calling on me, Leon. <laughs> <laughs> Put me but, out um, of a job. I don't mind. No, I, I want to say too, um, I, and I want to be very, very clear when I say this. It may not, it does not always have to be about money. Okay. Yes, organizations, nonprofits, we do need money to survive. Yes, that is absolutely right. We have staff, they have families, they need salaries, so forth and so on. But if money is not, in, if you're not financially able to contribute $5, $10, it is all tax deductible. Trust me when I tell you, okay? Time and volunteerism is also extremely important. And I want to say that because we don't have to be crabs in a barrel to say, well, I want to compete with and I want to create the extra thing. We can come together as a collective unit. If that space already exists, join, give your time and your talents and volunteer, right? Um, and I, and I want to just stress that the collectiveness of that power, um, because it means so much more when we are standing together as a unit, as in separate little islands. Um, and I've seen that happen over and over again. When we're separated, we will ultimately fail. But we, we, when we're collectively together, it's just, one, it's beautiful. And then two is just extremely powerful. Um, and so I just wanted to, to name that too. Philanthropy can be financial, but philanthropy can also be your time, your talents, and other types of resources that you want to give um, to a community, a community of your choice, to a purpose of your choice, to a mission of your choice. Don't feel forced to do things. Um, and if it doesn't exist, then go out and create, but make sure that it's also a purpose and mission aligned. I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you for that, Dr. Shaka. And, and forgive me, I need help with this, but there's an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. And what's the rest of, the rest of that? And if you want to go far, go together. Come on. Thank you. Thank you. Exactly. If you want to go far, go together. And I, I think without imposing anything, that's what a lot of this conversation has been pointing to, how far we can get by going together, the value in that. And to your point, Andrea, about being fearful, being scared, I have to guess, and I, it's only a guess that at some point, Harriet Tubman had to be afraid. I'm sure Dr. King was at some point afraid. And we could go on and on. And I know for a fact that in our community, sometimes fear is our friend that actually gets us into action. Agree. So thank you for that. Thank you for that. And so in honoring our time, 
because we are past one o'clock um, and I am a respecter of people's time. Any closing thoughts folks would love to share before we wrap it up? I just wanted to mention what an honor it was to be asked to be a part of this panel. Um, I, I understand that the my three fellow panelists have achieved amazing things throughout their lives and their careers. And this has truly been a beautiful experience. And um, I'm so excited to hear about all the wonderful work that we'll continue to do moving forward. Thank you for that, Ashley. Andrea, then Eric. Yeah, I, I want to, of course, uh, when I was invited to be a part of it, I was sort of like, wait, what? <laughs> right? Um, because I, I think of how I think about what I'm doing. I'm, I'm not, there's no master plan here around, you know, I'm doing this and that, and it's part of this thing, right? It's just, what is the need? What what is the need? What does our community need? How what what is in my power? Um, I, I don't have that much power, but whatever you know, I I think we don't use our social capital as much as we could. I'm so inspired, Eric. I'm going to be stalking you real soon <laughs> um, <laughs> by your fund and and how you were able to help it grow. And that's what, right, I, I would love for us all to do is how do we stay connected? How do we teach each other? How do we help each other? Um, and so I, I just, I'm a lifelong learner. I'm going to stay curious and I'm going to keep stepping forward. But, you know, doubling down on Ashley's comments, such an honor to be here. And I also wanted to think, I know some of the participants have left. I've been watching the comments in the chat. And I'm, I'm, I'm inspired by their notes and their messages and just the love that they're sending forward. So I just want to thank all the participants that took time out of their day to come be a part of this conversation, too. So thank you all. Absolutely, Andre. Thank you. Eric, please. Yeah. Uh, again, Leon, thank you. Anytime I can share a screen or a stage with you, like, you know, I always <laughs> say because um, you are my brother and Andrea and Ashley was so great. And I'm blessed to meet you both in, in Chaka. Dr. Chaka, I'm sorry. Um, you know, I love you. It's so good to spend time with you. Um, I think what I would like to say last is that there is a price to pay for dreaming. There is a price to pay for loving your people. And so you you know, I would caution and inspire, encourage, hopefully, people to continue to love, especially our people. Um, but there is a price for that. And, and I, I believe that love is the one thing that disrupts power. And so if in fact you choose to continue to love, you have to be ready to um, deal with the fact that you are disrupting the flow of power wherever you are. Thank you for that. So powerful. Dr. Shaka. Got to go behind Rev. So <laughs> I, 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 too, am extremely humbled when I got the invitation. I was like, oh, wow. But I will say this. I am in my own personal space where I'm accepting the spaces that I'm being invited into. And, and I'm very, very humble and appreciative of that. And I hope that today's conversation and our individual stories um, and, and even our tragic experiences that have brought even more light into the world um, is an inspiration for everyone that's on this call. Um, I do wanna extend myself for open conversations with folks, um, additional partnerships and communications. But I will also say to you, and as Eric said, there's a price. I am the type of person who was about collaboration, not about usage or being taken advantage of, right? Um, I am I'm open to continuing the empowerment of our community. Um, Higher Heights has an E3 philosophy to empower, encourage, and engage. 
Um, and so I just want to make sure that we continue to do that work. Um, and I, I just want to say thank you, um, Dr. Bailey, and to the Community Foundation to the, and all the other partners for allowing us to be here today. Absolutely. Absolutely. Are you good, Ashley? Do you have anything to weigh in? Are you good? Oh, yeah. I think I, I, think I said my piece. Right? Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Good, good, good. So yeah, let me just say a couple of things in, in, in wrapping up. First of all, thank each and every one of you from the bottom of my heart, because yes, this is part of my job, but the part that has my heart engaged and my spirit engaged is beyond the job. And I hope you all had an experience of that being present in this process, because each of you brought that powerfully to this conversation such that it wasn't just another checkbox conversation, but a conversation one that doesn't necessarily have to be sanctioned by an organization, but is sanctioned and endorsed by a higher power. Because we know we're two or more gathered together. All right, I'll stop there. Because then <laughs> and I am definitely going to look into and have conversations with you and others about maybe this should happen more often than Black uh, Philanthropy Month. Maybe there's a thread here that needs to be lifted up on a regular basis. Maybe that's a power and a gift here that's calling for greater expression. And this might be the voice. This might be the pathway. So I thank you. I acknowledge each and every one of you for your contribution and the gift that was provided for all folks who participated in this process. I also thank the folks from each of the organizations who gathered together to pull this together, to pull it off. Shari from Hartford, Erica here at the Community Foundation, Ryan Fairfield's community, and Orsella from the Prosperity Foundation. If you want to get more information and local engagement, you know, touch base with one of these folks, or actually any of these folks, because we have reached a point of collaboration such that this is something we have done several years collectively. And that's, that's a powerful statement by itself. So thank you for the generosity of your spirit and your time. I am so pleased with this process and this result, and I can only imagine what it provided for the folks who were in intent, who were in, in who attended. Yeah, right. So, and if you want to get any information, further information about your particular uh, community foundation or the Prosperity uh, Foundation, it's right there on the screen. So, thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. And I'm actually declaring this gathering, this webinar complete. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you all. Thank bye you bye. so much. Thank you.